Good evening. I'd like to um, call the City of Mount Vernon City Council meeting for September 14, 2022 to order. The time is now 7.05. If you would please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> it's very nice to hear a lot of people saying that, so we welcome our visitors tonight. Um, item C is our roll call of council members. I'll ask the clerk to please call the roll. Councilmember Beaton? Here. Councilmember Rocksmith? Here. Councilmember Correas? Here. Councilmember Hudson? Here. Councilmember Hulse? Here. Councilmember Molinar? Here. Councilmember Morales? Here. Thank you. Item two under our com is our community comments. Um, just a reminder, our community comments also follow the rules of decorum per our Mount Vernon Municipal Code 2.12.100. That means it will be enforced for both written comments and public comments tonight. First up is a review of emails from the public. I know we've got several community comments to be read as emails from the public. And I just wanted to let the group here know, since I know why you all are here too, um, that um, we did receive a community comment from the owner of Eagle Mont. Um, we are compelled to read it as part of the public record. However, it wouldn't, is not a subject of debate between the HOA and the owner um, in this particular public forum, but I did want you to know you'll be hearing things from the owner as well. So with that, I'll turn it over and ask Peter Donovan if there's community comments from the public. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, there are community comments tonight. I was worried there wouldn't be enough interest, but <laughs> happy to see everyone. Uh, the first letter is from Aaron Waters, and Aaron writes to City Council, Dear Council Members, I solo rafted the Skagit River from Concrete to Conway and made stops along the way with anticipation of Mount Vernon for coffee, which was much more difficult than expected for, for accessing town. River traffic, including recreationally, is an attraction and highlight to put to pedestrians, people watching from the river walk, at least as evidenced this holiday weekend. I expected there to be easy access for available public docking and approach to the east side of downtown Mount Vernon directly at the river walk, but there is not. Private slips for docking were noticed and post trip asking after from the visitor center. I was recommended to the public park and sandbar opposite of downtown but there could easily be a small public dock created directly below the river walk. A small public river walk dock and traffic with possibly a new outdoor recreation business, at least seasonally for one to two hours or a full day with kayak rentals, paddle boards, e-bikes would likely be well received as a new business commercially, as well as provide opportunity within families and relationships to encourage and support outdoor active interests, whether already on their own equipment or gathering pre or post lunch or dinner immediately above the created public dock right at the river walk. I am myself a bicyclist largely for ways and means of transportation regionally as well as Amtrak bike and ride shuttles and Washington ferries. Rafting the Skagit this past weekend is something I look forward to doing again to Eagle Watch in January pending the festival if it continues in forward motion this winter. Separately I want to comment ab about note in conversation about pending changes in town in Mount Vernon mentioned by the staff person from the visitor center about the county courthouse being visually a visual anchor and arrival into Mount Vernon from the south. I understand from him that there is a tentative plan to relocate the library to the parking lot that is frontage to the block south of the courthouse. Have you asked input of Mount Vernon locally or your citizenry and residents? My own objection is for reason of visual anchor that the county courthouse is from the south in approach to town. My first experience of bike bicycling from Camino Island to Anacortes via Mount Vernon clicked about your town and route in a similarly to farm to market road, the history of place and people. I hadn't before then had a clear sense of Mount Vernon, re identity of town until making that approach and the experience added to my appreciation and connection. I understand there's a concern for available parking for which the relocation of library would provide. However, with a real price paid cost to the urban feng shui. The current parking lot that is a block from the southern approach to the courthouse, although having provided needed parking, is a block to flow of chi and energy 
and I have noticed there being community issues visible in the half-mile approach around this. A change is important and needed, but the expense to environmental health to remove and or move the many mature trees surrounding that lot is a real cost. Please ask your citizenry and residents for their input before breaking ground on this change. Kind regards, Aaron, Aaron Waters from Camino Island. Next email is from Christina Tarvin. I am concerned with the lack of maintenance at the Eaglemont Golf Course by the new owner. As a neighbor, I walk along the streets of Eaglemont and have noticed the decline of the golf course. In my visits to homes on the golf course, the lack of maintenance and increase in dry grass and greens has, concerned, has me concerned about fire hazards and increased liability to homeowners. I hope the Mount Vernon City Council is willing to enforce the terms of the permit for the Eaglemont Golf Course and encourage the new owner to build a strong relationship with the community. Christina Tarvin. The next email is from Tim Langenberg. Dear Mayor Boudreau, my name is Tim Langenberg, and I am the Executive Director of Beacon Hill International Ministries. I currently reside at 500 East George Hopper Road in Burlington. Beacon Hill is headquartered in Tempe, Arizona. Beacon Hill is also registered to operate in the state of Washington, where our local address is 4800 Eaglemont Drive. Beacon Hill acquired certain assets that formerly comprised the Eaglemont Golf Course in May of this year with a plan to develop an ecumenical retreat center for pastors and their spouses there. As you are no doubt aware, our acquisition has been met with some skepticism by members of the Eaglemont Homeowners Association, resulting in both a letter from council representing the association to which I have responded and a meeting before Mount Vernon City Council this evening which I just became aware of yesterday. Because of the abrupt notice, the interests of Beacon Hill cannot adequately be represented this evening, so I would kindly ask that the sentiments expressed in my attached letter be read before council and the public in attendance. Separately, it would be my hope to have guidance from the appropriate departments within your administration regarding our plans for the site. That effort is being facilitated by our project architect. It is my sincere wish that we can move beyond the misunderstanding that has dominated much of our communication with and from members of the association to date and begin to build a lasting relationship of trust and cooperation in its place. Thank you in advance for your kindness in helping us navigate these uncharted waters. Sincerely, Tim Langenberg. And here is the attached letter. I am in receipt, uh, dear Mr. England, I am in receipt of your letter dated September 1st, 2022 on behalf of your client the Eaglemont Homeowners Association as it relates to the acquisition by our organization, Beacon Hill International Ministries, of certain property within the city of Mount Vernon, Washington, having been commonly known and operated as Eaglemont Golf Course until its permanent closure on April 4, 2020. An April 17, 2020 article in NBC's Golf Pass eulogized it succinctly under the headline, quote, New amenities can't save Eaglemont, end quote. National golf writer Jason Scott Deegan writes, quote, The loss of Eaglemont, located in Mount Vernon, Washington, about 90 minutes north of Seattle, erases one of the most scenic courses along the I-5 corridor, end quote. Before proceeding further, I want to note that although Beacon Hill retains counsel for both its nonprofit and property acquisition activities, we have not yet retained counsel for either land use or municipal law. Therefore, until counsel has been selected and can adequately research and respond to the matters herein contemplated, we are not yet fully prepared to address all the concerns you expressed relevant to the association. However, I can make the following general statements and observations. First, Beacon Hill is neither a golf course nor a restaurant operator. Rather, Beacon Hill is an Arizona nonprofit tax-exempt corporation licensed to operate in the state of Washington. That was reestablished in 2017 for the purpose of providing restorative ministry and respite for Christian leaders and their spouses of all denominations who are exiting ministry at an alarming rate. More than 75,000 leaders burned out, washed out, or were pushed out of their pastorates last year alone. That level of attrition has been happening for decades and cannot be sustained. It has grave implications for the Christian church at large. 
Beacon Hill represents one small but important effort to stem that tide. Second, Beacon Hill did not buy an operating golf course. It acquired real property and improvements that formerly constituted a golf course, but which had been shuttered for more than two years. The property, the property was in derelict condition, having, after having been permanently closed, as noted above, and maintained to only a minimal standard throughout that period. Moreover, its principal asset, a 20,000 square foot clubhouse, sustained almost irreparable damage from water as a result of fire suppression and other plumbing lines bursting during a deep freeze in January of this year before Beacon Hill's purchase. Damage estimates range from $2 million to $3 million and include extensive remediation costs for black mold, which saturated almost the entire building within days of the water damage event. It is worth noting that Beacon Hill was protected by contract against any adverse material change in value during the contract period covered by our PSA, and as such, Beacon Hill was to be the recipient of any insurance claim in favor of the former owner stemming from this water damage incident. However, immediately upon closing the purchase transaction, the seller's insurance claim was denied because of both its failure to maintain heat in the building and failure to mitigate the resulting damage in a timely manner. Our decision to move forward with a modified PSA despite the damage relied heavily upon a favorable settlement of that insurance claim inuring to the benefit of Beacon Hill. Unfortunately, that did not happen. It should also be noted that the clubhouse has constituted fully 90% of the $7 million assessed value of the property since the construction of the building in 2011. With the 216-acre land balance zoned agricultural, averaging a scant $750,000. So clearly our emphasis has and will continue to be on saving the building from further loss to black mold, efforts which have now been abruptly halted by a stop work order issued because of false claims made by the members of the association that we were building without a permit. Nothing could be further from the truth. We have been solely engaged in emergency remediation under the guidance of a leading remediation firm, a process that is that has to be completely uh, has to be completed before we can restore heat to the building before winter. We have months of remediation work remaining, but we are dead in our tracks, thus risking a repeat of more of the same kind of damage the building sustained last winter from fr frozen pipes. The damage is so extensive that once we can resume remediation, we are at least 18 months to two years from a finished building. Indeed, it would be much faster to build a new building in its place. Third, as a gesture of goodwill and at considerable financial sacrifice, more than $62,000 in fact, Beacon Hill did maintain its property for the benefit of the association for the first three months following our purchase. The president of the association even expressed his appreciation in writing for our sacrifice. However, we are not in a position to sacrifice further in that regard, particularly considering our massive unplanned expenditure for the building. We simply cannot divert over $250,000 a year to lawn maintenance from the funds entrusted to us by our donors for vital ministry. Therefore, I suggested early on to select members of the association, both in person and in writing, that if they were concerned about the appearance of our property, they would have to shoulder the cost of its maintenance expense. That request was soundly rejected, with members of the association believing instead that we could be cajoled into doing it for them at our own expense. Fourth, it was recently brought to my attention by our outdoor maintenance team that the pond which provided first stage irrigation for Eaglemont, as well as for property owned by the association, was dangerously low. To the point of sucking sludge into our pumps and risking significant additional damage to our already overtaxed irrigation infrastructure. I immediately responded, I'm, excuse me, I immediately suspended further output. Moreover, our property is a designated wildlife habitat, frequented by, frequented by deer and a host of smaller mammals, a plethora of waterfowl and other avian life, as well as the occasional eagle, black bear, or cougar. The water systems on our property are critical to their existence. It is reckless, short-sighted, and irresponsible to deplete our natural, naturally sourced water supply for green lawns. Nor can we justify some $50,000 per month to purchase potable water from the public utility district for that purpose, unless the association wants to pay for it. 
Beacon Hill is not Santa Claus bearing gifts. This is Washington, after all. The property will green up on its own in due time. Lastly, golf, which is the subject on everyone's mind. I will leave a definitive response to council, but I can make some general comments in an effort to quell at least some curiosity and rumors in the meantime. Eaglemont is 20 years old, which is the half-life of the average golf course. That means all of its critical infrastructure is near the end of its useful life. In real terms, that would require massive near-term capital investment. Estimates for essential irrigation upgrades alone exceed $5 million. Bridge and cart path uh, restoration will cost over a million dollars. Another million dollars will be needed for new maintenance equipment. At least 80 carts, if they can be found, will be staggeringly expensive to obtain, even on a leased basis. Green's replacement clocks in at over $300,000. The necessary fertilizers, chemicals, sand, water, and basic utilities will require hundreds of thousands of dollars more per year. An annual payroll will need to increase sixfold to over $800,000 to support even minimal operations. And that's with no clubhouse, pro shop, or restaurant, which will pile on several million more to replace. Taken together, it would realistically require some $10 million to restore golf operations to the property. Not including the millions of dollars to purchase debt Beacon Hill is already carrying. Something our predecessor was not burdened with. Even if that money could be found through a wealthy benefactor willing to lose money on our part or an extravagantly generous investment by members of the association, the capital costs belie an undermining problem, demographics. Eaglemont was a disproportionately expensive course to build and maintain in a largely blue-collar town far from a major metro area, and competitors with far lower operating costs, smaller footprints, and less challenging topographies abound. So, from inception, Eaglemont hemorrhaged cash, losing multiple millions of dollars through its history. In a best-case scenario, its cost per round would have to double, with its number of rounds at least tripled, to not lose money. That's not a gamble our nonprofit ministry can afford to take, and I seriously doubt the association would want to take on that risk either. So where the, does that leave us? I think we are back to a maintenance regime by our crew that the association would have to pay for. It would give the appearance of golf without exposing the association or ourselves to the catastrophic loss we would otherwise incur. Interestingly, it has frequently it has frequently been brought to my attention by the association leadership that a majority of the association's members are not really interested in golf. Most do not even play. Instead, they want the, the ambiance and perceived property value enhancement of living on a golf course without having to cover their decks with netting in order to safely be outside. In other words, they want privately subsidized open space. Except at the end of the day, someone has to pay for that, and it cannot be Beacon Hill. Mr. England, surely you know that there is not a court in this nation that would force Beacon Hill or any other entity or any individual to reopen and operate the decaying, the decaying carcass of a dead and failed business model at a loss. So that veiled threat and the delusions it fosters with, within elements of the association are not productive. This is not China or North Korea after all. Eaglemont, though, magnificently beautiful in its setting, was fundamentally flawed from the beginning as a golf course. And as Beacon Hill and other contenders proved conclusively, it was not financeable as a golf course either. So let me state again clearly, Beacon Hill did not acquire a business or any prior obligations attached thereto. Eaglemont, as noted above, was dead and buried long before we came along. However, as with those we are endeavoring to serve, it is our hope that it can be transformed, even repurposed, into a gloriously better new life. I am encouraged that the association has obtained counsel, and I remain optimistic that with your assistance, we can reach a mutually beneficial accord in that hope. I extend my warmest regards. Tim Langenberg. And a final email to council is from Bobby and Patricia uh, Bedemy. Have you used the Riverwalk lately? Mount Vernon spent millions of tax dollars on the Riverwalk project, and it is supposed to be the focal point of the city. If you walked it today, this is what you will find. It's being neglected. Weeds waist high in planters, graffiti on electrical boxes by bridge, weeds coming up in the joints, in the small tunnel, urine stains and stench, 
hanging baskets wilting due to no water, feces on the sidewalk, trash, trash between the rail and the river. The entire length needs to be power washed, swept, or blown. Benches are delaminated on armrests. Steps are covered with leaves. And the overall message is no one in city government cares. The taxpayer investment is being allowed to slowly decay. It's one thing to build these high dollar projects and another to ignore them after the money has been spent and the new glow dimmed. If you doubt any of, my, any of this, please take a stroll. My wife and I walk this route every day. Bobby and Patricia. That is all of the written comments. All right. Thank you, Peter. Um, again, just reiterating that the, uh, the, the letter that um, Peter has read out loud is from the owner of Eaglemont to the Eaglemont Association attorney. It was not addressed to the city council other than being asked to be read as a community comment. So I want to make sure that that's clear. Um, also, I would assume that that is coming to the Eaglemont Association, but it is also considered a public record, which has been forwarded on to our contact with the Homeowners Association as well. All right. Um, with that, we have now our public comment time. And so um, anyone wishing to speak, you're certainly welcome to step to the podium. The podium is right here in the front with a microphone. If you would please state your name, your city of residence. We like to do our comments around three minutes, but we clearly give leeway um, when there's uh, interest in these types of conversations. So is there anyone willing to speak? And I believe Mr. Bagley is here. So I'll invite Mr. Bagley forward. Mayor Boudreaux, city council members, my neighbors and friends from Eaglemont. Uh, before I read the letter that I brought, I want to make it really clear that this is the first time we've heard any of this from Mr. Langenberg. So the fact that we have an attorney and uh, we have recourse, it's not anything I can talk about tonight because we just got the letter. Okay. So. So obviously, a lot of the things he said aren't the way we look at things, um, and and we will uh, get back to Mr. Langenberg. The letter that I'm going to read, uh, we sent uh, to the city council about maybe two weeks ago. Dear Mount Vernon Council members. As residents of Mount Vernon and the Eaglemont community, we are writing to ask for your support in requiring the new owner of the Eaglemont Golf Course, Beacon Hills International Ministries, to comply with the terms of the planned unit development that the city approved for Eaglemont in 1992. Many of us moved to this neighborhood because of the golf course, and we believe our property values and the nature of the community is dependent on this being a public golf course, as the permit requires. We also believe the city was right to require it to be a public golf course, accessible to the public, and not restricted to private use. The new owner has allowed members of his church com community to play the course while prohibiting public use. He is also hosting church meetings and campouts at what he promotes as, quote, the former Eaglemont Golf Course, close quote. Property owners in the city are required to meet the terms of the permits issued by the city, and the quality of life for all residents is dependent on the city enforcing the requirements of all permits. By taking necessary action, you will not only be supporting the hundreds of residents in the immediate neighborhood near the course, but also keeping a commitment to the entire community to make certain the owners maintain and provide access to an important community amenity. Thank you. Um, there's a lot of us here, and we'll probably be back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I certainly don't want to ignore the fact that there are so many, and I want to thank all of you for taking time to come out. I think I want to also assure you that um, we hear I'll let the council speak for themselves, but I, I hear our office hears um, of the great concern, which I think concerns all of us. Mm -hmm. Currently, the city has retained some outside counsel to advise us of different legalities interpretations, so I think there'll be more to come from what the city legally can do and cannot do as well. 
Um, and I've re been really, really appreciative of Mr. Bagley's um, communication directly with Peter Donovan from the mayor's office so that there's a conduit back and forth where you can hear directly from the city's position. It can go to your homeowners association board and then be disseminated so that you know that you're getting good information directly from the city um, back to your to your group. And that will continue uh, until we can find some sort of pathway forward from what the city can do, but also um, I admire the fact that your group has organized themselves, retained counsel to um, advocate on your interests in a legal uh, realm as well. So I don't wanna just ignore all of you sitting here in the room. Um, certainly you're welcome to speak if you would like, um, but I wanted to also um, to, to share that information from the city's perspective at this point. So we, uh, we also don't have anything to share with you um, from that legal perspective, but we'll at our soonest opportunity. So. If there's anyone else willing to speak, you're welcome. You're welcome to approach um, as well. And again, if you could state your name, city of residence. You bet. Thank you. So thank you, Mayor, Council. So Kent Haberly, uh, reside at the golf course, Seagull Mont, 12th hole, 61006 Unison Place. We purchased our lot uh, four years ago and started building and moved in two years ago. And right in the midst of construction, Fred Lee let us know that the golf course was shut down, and that was a shock. Well, we didn't move there just because of the golf course. That was a major factor for us. We have a spectacular view, and we've appreciated the fact it's been maintained for all that time until recently. So I've been mowing weeds out in front of us. So it, it's, it's a great spot. We love it. Uh, I just wanted to go back. 30 years ago, and some of you have been around long enough, Gary, you know, you remember, <laughs> Melissa, you may be too young for that, but when this <laughs> golf course was approved uh, by, the, by the city, the public access was a major consideration. I and mean, there was a lot of uproar around the community about concern about that being a private course. And so the developers at that point, I mean, they, I think they obviously wanted it open to the public, but that was made a, a critical element of the of the approval of the PUD. And it's not agricultural zone, by the way. It's a PUD overlay that provides for what we've created up there. So some of it's a final plat, some of it several hundred acres aren't yet. So just to clear that up, I'm sure you all understand that. Um, but access to the public was a critical issue. And the master plan provides for public access on bike paths, uh, pedestrian paths, and some of them are in, uh, trails, nature trails, it's all on the master plan. You can take a look at it. It's clear, it's all of record, and it was part of the ordinance that, that was approved. And I know some of you, Mayor, see you walking by our house almost every day with your dog. So the public is using that. We see people pulling into the parking lot on Wa and, and Eaglemont Drive, that's next to our home. Uh, people from outside the community, daily, I mean several, as many as five, ten cars in there. They get out and walk their dogs or go for a walk around the, uh, around the course and or walk out on the course. We see people out pulling in and just taking golf balls out and hitting golf balls. But it's a public amenity, and I don't want to understate how important that is. It's not just for the Eaglemont homeowners. It's for the entire public, and that was a critical element of, of the uh, ordinance when it was passed. So aside from everything else you've heard, to me, that's critical. You need to consider that as we work through this. There's a public trust that we have where we trust you to do the right thing for the community. And that's really what we expect. And it's for anything, anything we're doing, traffic or police, we trust the city to do the right thing. So thank you very much. And anybody else? Come, come on. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Oh, excuse me. Oops. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Gerald Barron, and like uh, Mr. Haberly, I live on the golf course. We actually live on the 13th fairway, and we purchased this property a few years ago uh, because it was a golf course, um, and we've loved that community, and we want it to be part of a golf course community. Um, we didn't necessarily um, base our trust on the fact that it was owned by someone because I think everyone knows kind of the history of ownership. But we did base it on the fact that um, the city had permitted it for the uses that 
that uh, Kent was talking about. So we had confidence in the city and its permitting. Uh, in 2020, we also uh, made another investment in Eaglemont, and we purchased a lot actually next door to Mr. Haverly. And so we are planning on, uh, we've been planning on building a house there. Uh, and in the process of doing that, we've had the, uh, the pleasure of dealing with the permit department of um, the city of Mount Vernon. <laughs> Um, and uh, came away from that experience absolutely convinced that the city is very, um, it, it is, is very intent on making certain that the laws and the rules and the ordinances and the permit process are followed. I'm conv completely convinced of that. Um, so the, um, the question I guess I have is um, we made these decisions based upon the understanding of what the permit required. I know it as a, a property owner that if I don't comply with the terms of the permit, I'm going to be held accountable for that. And I think um, that, that that should be true of other permit holders as well. Uh, and if they bought that with the idea that they uh, didn't need to necessarily follow that, that's on them. It's not on the city and not on the uh, impact of the people who are, who are affected by that. Um, if the city does have a justified reason for not enforcing the terms of the permit, then I hope there is a good, clear explanation for all of us that we can understand it. Because if that happens, um, and if there isn't that, sort of that very clear understanding, the assumption is going to be that permit enforcement is a matter of uh, preference of the city and not universally applied. And I hope that doesn't happen. So thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'm Bob Weigel. I live on 1801, 1808 Baker View Court, just down at the bottom of the hill of the clubhouse. Uh, we moved here in 2008. We built the home there. Uh, we came up here because it was a golf course. Um, the nice thing about it is it's, re it's formed a bond with my wife and I. She never played golf before. She's got two hole-in-ones <laughs> on this course. So, you know, it's, it's been a wonderful experience. But one thing I'd like to point out to you that sometimes people don't think about. I play up there, and I, you know, because it is close, and I'm close to the clubhouse, and I got a weekly membership, I'll go up in the afternoon and play. And Corey, the pro up there, says, hey, I've got a couple of guys from Canada. Would you like to play with them? And it's amazing how many people from out of the country from out of the state and other areas around come and play the Eaglemont Golf Course. I can tell you for a fact, I've played in tournaments with people from Denver, Colorado that came all the way here to play in the tournament. I've played in people down in Seattle, in Oregon, in Portland. You know, this course was named as one of the top 10 courses, public courses in the state. And there's no reason it can't remain that. We had a wonderful greenskeeper that was maintaining the games before they shut it down that even he, and he's from Brandon Dunes, was saying this is a wonderful golf course. So I just want to point out the uh, emphasis on the fact that you may not be aware, but it draws a lot of people into our community to play that course. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. I'm not great at this. I'm here as a citizen, and I'm somewhat concerned because I advocate not for the privilege, but for affordable housing. So please don't view us all as the privilege asking for the golf course, even though I fully acknowledge we are that. Many people may not be able to afford that golf course, however, my husband and I downsized and moved to Eagle Mont um, because it had a golf course and also because it had a restaurant and a place to socialize and meet that was affordable. My husband's an avid golfer. I've tried. I fail miserably. <laughs> but I love the fact that there's been a public golf course I also want to express to you all that when we moved in, and currently homeowners and the association, we did not receive benefits for being on the golf course. We did not pay for that. 
It was a public golf course. So it's not set up the way I believe another member on golf courses in Skagit County. It is a public golf course. Yes, I, I understand that a lot of people may not be able to afford to golf, but it's a lovely outlet. It's a lovely other sport available to folks. And I have concerns that um, this neighborhood may turn into a very different neighborhood with Beacon Hills Ministry. I've looked into the ministry and I have major concerns about us staying what may become a Christian kind of central focus ministry, which excludes people of faith of other religions, and it feels quite exclusive. And all of you who know me know that I try to be as inclusive as possible, and I certainly don't want to make our neighborhood appear exclusive, exclusive to only the Christians. Um, I don't know if I'm being clear or not. I'm not great at this, but uh, <laughs> my husband's better. <laughs> he just didn't come up fast enough. <laughs> You do just like, could I get your name for the record? I'm sorry. I'm Lynn Campbell. Lynn Campbell, thank you. And um, the other thing is we did a survey in uh, amongst the residents, and I know that over 60% said that they bought because of the golf course. I also know we have neighboring neighborhoods. I have good friends in Montreux and uh, um, the neighboring neighborhoods who also bought there because of the golf course, and they also golf. And we had women's golf leagues and other golf leagues, and so it really was a place for the community to gather, to play uh, bridge, to golf. They did a number of activities, and I have serious concerns about what's happening. So I am hoping the city council is able to take a look at whatever bill that the attorneys have so wisely referenced and be able to uphold that. That's all. Thanks. Thank you, Lynn. <laughs> yeah, my name is uh, <clears throat> Ron Raskowski, and I'm not a member of the Eagle Mount HOA, and I don't live on the golf course. There was a time, however, I could have hit the 12th green with my five iron, but not anymore. <laughs> um, since 1992, I personally have been calling it Evil Mont. Uh, for me, it's too hard to play. My wife finally convinced me to let her take her out there once, and we left 22 balls out there somewhere. <laughs> um, so the golf course part of it isn't my primary interest, but it's the person who is now the new owner. Um, I'm more concerned about, he's obviously not a golfer or a restaurateur because he's going to let both of them decline. Uh, but my primary interest is he's sounding like a corporate raider to me, um, which is to let everything go to, to fallow. And then the next thing he's going to be coming in to see you uh, and asking for a change in the zoning so it can be um, developed with more housing. That's the part that makes me swallow my cud. So uh, that's, that's primarily my interest, and I hope that you would take that into consideration because the additional traffic and additional housing out there, I know it means taxes, which is going to be a hard part for the city to do without, uh, but you're going to make a lot of enemies if you allow that to happen. Thank you. So hello, my name is Deborah Wheeler, and um, I do not live in a home that's directly on the golf course, but I do live in Eaglemont. <laughs> and I'm concerned with the water. Um, Eaglemont has a right-of-way and has accessed water from the golf course since we've been there. And I went up myself and spoke to Mr. Langenberg uh, probably <coughs> two weeks ago and asked that he turn the water back on. At that point, he told me the pond that the water comes from had well over a meter of water in it and that he would turn it on. 
I thanked him for that. I explained to him that the HOA has a meter on our irrigation system that I would take a picture of and record the number on that meter. We would run the irrigation for one day, one cycle. I would record the number of gallons used, and at that point I would come back to him so that he would know that we have got done a very good job of controlling the water. We're not overwatering, but it is extremely important to the HOA that the landscaping be maintained. We have thousands of dollars worth of landscaping on WA. We have thousands of man hours going into maintaining a very attractive neighborhood that is of great benefit to the community. Mr. Langenberg could promise me he would turn the water on and he did not. We've rented a water truck from the city and watered once. Today, I sent a letter to all the homeowners asking them to get any container of any size they could, fill it with water, and go pour it on WA, because otherwise our landscaping is going to die. So I feel that I live in a very beautiful community where the community puts tremendous number of hours into maintaining that appearance. We should be something the city of Mount Vernon can be proud of, we try and be proud in the city of Mount Vernon. I think Mr. Langenberg perhaps changes his story quite often, but I would really appreciate any help. Uh, the city has been, the PUD has been gracious and has found me a water main, and I will find a way to get water to WA next year. It doesn't solve my problem this year. That's, I appreciate anything you can do to help us. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you. With that, we'll go ahead and close community comments. Go ahead, please. My name is Kelly Pickering. I live at uh, 1806 uh, Bakerview Court here in Mount Vernon. Our neighbor, young couple, just two houses from us, listed their home about 10 days ago. They had a very interested buyer, <coughs> potential buyer come in and loved the house. <coughs> didn't feel the price was unreasonable, and said, why don't you resolve the issue with the golf course? I'd like to uh, buy your house. But right now, because of the uncertainty, I don't want to make that decision. So that's one of the fallouts that, that, that's happening. I guess uncertainty leads to all kinds of rumors. And on one of the corners where we planted flowers, uh, when they mulched it, they put a bunch of flags in to show where the flowers were so they wouldn't uh, damage them or cause damage to them. Well, a couple of us were driving to dinner, and someone said, what's that there? I says, well, that's where they're burying all the rumors. <laughs> 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 I just hope the water issue can be resolved. The greens are parched and look like a desert. Uh, one of the gentlemen in charge of our landscape committee who had surgery yesterday can't be here. He showed me a picture tonight of the green in front of his home. It's number 17. It, it looked like a parched desert with weeds growing and it, 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 it's all the soils being cracked. So. Water is very crucial to maintaining the beauty that whether we play golf on it or we look at it, that we appreciate. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Would you like to come up? Member Drow, council, friends and neighbors, I'm Tim Langenberg. Uh, the guy that everybody's not too fond of right now in the room. But I just wanted to make a few comments, and, and Deborah Wheeler, I want to speak specifically to your comments. Um, I was actually at the clubhouse a couple of weeks ago, and she and Mr. Begley and another gentleman stopped by, and I heard noise downstairs, and they actually had just come in and were downstairs looking around, and so I went down to inquire and 
you know, ask if they needed something. They said, turn on our water. And I said, well, would you like to sit down and talk? And so we did sit down and, and talk. And I did, in fact, agree to turn the water back on temporarily so they could get a meter read. And before I could do that, the next morning, we had a stop work order put on the building. And the stop work order is the result of a number of complaints from homeowners that resulted in this order. And interestingly, we're using the largest mitigation company in the state. They've done thousands of commercial mitigation jobs for decades. They've never encountered a requirement for a remediation permit before. And part of the reasoning for that is that often damage occurs during the winter when offices are closed, things have to be done right away. It's just never traditionally been a requirement. And we need to get that removed from our door so that we can save this building. Ms. Wheeler's concerned about a few thousand dollars worth of shrubs. We have a multi-million dollar building that constitutes 90% of the value of what we purchased that's borderline right now in terms of our being able even to save the building. We need to get back to remediation and I, I just wanted to appeal to you to see what we can do to remove that as soon as possible. I don't think there is such a thing as a remediation permit. We're not building, we're not demolishing, we're just getting wet material out of the building so we can get rid of the black mold. And then lastly, I just want to make a, a general comment. I know that all of you are concerned, and, and I'm Mr. concerned Langford, for you. Mr. Langford, this isn't the forum for the city council to sort of entertain a back and forth. It's a public comment directly to the city council and the mayor. So if you would just direct your comments specifically to us, that would be great. Pardon me, surely. Right, thank you. Um, but I, I just wanted to say, you know, when I was a, a kid, I used to love the circus. My grandparents every year took me to Barnum and Bailey, and they were an institution for 150 years. But over time, great as it was, the model just didn't work anymore. It started losing money and then losing more money. And finally, they shut down. And it was sad. It was the end of an era. But it shut down because economically, it didn't work. And imagine right now, you can go online and buy almost anything that the circus owned, up to and including the train that they rode in to go from town to town. Imagine if I were to buy a lion cage and a judge were to say, because you bought this lion cage, you have to go on the road and run a circus. Like, it's preposterous. We bought raw land, period. This was not financeable. We're gonna, we're gonna keep it. Uh, our civility okay. and decorum. Thank you so much. And then, uh, Mr. Langer, I'm going to ask you to wrap up your comments. You were given Surely. a chance I, for... I just wanted to yeah. emphasize the fact that this was not, as I indicated in my letter, not financeable as a golf course. Not by us, not by anybody. And yes, it's a beautiful course, and I, I share your sentiments that it would be you know, great if people could come from Canada and, and around the country and play here because it's a very unique course. The problem is, in its best year ever, the total revenue from golf was about three quarters of a million dollars. This is such a complex and expensive course that it takes multiple millions of dollars to run and operate, and you can't do that on such small revenue. <coughs> so we have to balance what would be ideal and great and lovely with the economic reality that there's going to be massive loss. We can't incur that. And if somebody from the homeowners wants to step in and help us, that would be great. Again, so okay, anyway, I'm going to ask wanted you to, to mention that. complete your comments. I appreciate um, thank it. Thank you for the, the time, but I, I want to address the, the right. water thing specifically. Thank you very much. All right, so I, here's again, I'm going to remind folks, this is not a forum to argue between the property <laughs> owner and the homeowners association. We have been very clear of the commitment of the city to do everything we can to look at legal options from a city government perspective. So I just want to say that, but you're welcome to come on up. My name is Mary Jo Reitzma. I live on the 13th fairway. We bought there because it was a golf course and uh, my husband died a year ago and my two sons-in-law have said since all of this came up, you need to get out of there. I don't want to leave my home. 
but yet I see the deterioration. Another thing I might just say is that the golf course closed because of COVID and Mr. Langenberg knew all about the building and the golf course when he bought that property. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Larry Jacobs, and um, I actually met with the new owner and went through his building and discussed with him. He says, this is going to be a state-of-the-art golf course. It's going to be nice. He told me how much it was going to cost. I'm going to put up a motel, he said. And he says, I'm going to redo the kitchen where the pro shop is and put the pro shop over there. And he had great, he bought a golf course. He knew he did. Hence, when he says he did not buy a golf course, he knew when he purchased it that it was a golf course. And he, you know, told me that this is going to be a nice course. Thank, thank you, Larry. Thank you. All right. All right, as we close up uh, community comments tonight, I will again <laughs> reiterate that um, Peter Donovan is going to be um, being able to communicate as regularly as possible. Um, the city's uh, information to the um, homeowners association as requested through Mr. Bagley or another officer if perhaps Mr. Bagley isn't available. Um, but we will want to know that we want consistent information coming from one source so that um, everyone gets the same information as as the situation unfolds. So I want to thank want to thank you for coming and I'm going to close community comments. But I'll open it up for council member comments now. So first off, I'd like to thank everybody for being here this evening. Um, it's a it's a issue that the city really hasn't run across in the past and so we're we're looking for guidance and i can assure you that the city council has talked with uh, our city attorney and it is, has encouraged him to seek outside counsel to find out how do we enforce the rules that were put in place back in 1992 what are our options on that so you you've been heard we appreciate you being here we're taking the steps that we need to take to see what we can do to help you and what legal what legal grounds we have to help you. And that was a, a direction, at a direction of the entire city council was to see what, what our legal options were. And we, at this point, we don't know what those are. <laughs> Any other council member comments? I want to make sure uh, the letters uh, in, in the public record mm -hmm. uh, and then obviously um, all the names. Mm -hmm. And Correct. make sure of that. Council, yeah, council received the letter with the, um, all the signed names that signed on from the Eagle Mon Association. So I want to make sure that they, you knew that that was received. Yep. Thanks, Gary. Right. Okay. Um, then moving on, we're going to move into our, our next agenda. Our consent agenda tonight is items A, B, and C. That's the approval of council meeting minutes, checks, wire transfers, and claim. I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. Second. Um, I'll speak in a minute first. All right. Uh, I believe it would be two, uh, the minutes for August uh, 24th under uh, item K. I uh, can't take credit. It was uh, Council Member Molinar that made the first uh, for that one. Uh, it lists me as the one who did that. I did not. So uh, we can just get that amended and uh, I'll seek approval as well after that. All right, does the clerk have that note? Awesome, thank you. So there's a motion by Melissa, second by Mark. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Motion carries, thank you. All right, under committee reports tonight, there is a Public Works and Library Committee. Council Member Gary Molinar will present the report. Go ahead, Gary. Okay, we opened up the uh, Public Works Library Committee um, at six o'clock tonight. Um, first up, Program Coordinator Division, uh, Blaine Chesterfield, uh, talked about the six new log aligners that uh, were installed uh, beginning on August 16th, and the, lo uh, the locations in the, the liners were uh, based upon the uh, 2021 flood event and will improve performance and reduce damage to the log boom that sits out in front of the plaza. The duckbill check valve at uh, the Hogue Road pump station damaged in the 2021 flood event was uh, replaced on August 30th, uh, 2022 with a checkmate inline backflow valve. Um, the flood wall components for the new uh, Mount Vernon Terminal Railroad and BNSF uh, mainline are being manufactured now and are estimated to arrive in September or early October. 
In anticipation of the components, a new stop log storage container has been purchased and will be modified to store uh, the new parts that are forthcoming. Uh, the freeway drive uh, force main outfall was completed on uh, September 8th, and uh, this project emphasized the outfall, outfall from an old 10-inch uh, uh, corrugated metal pipe to a 24 high-density polyethylene pipe. Uh, staff anticipates adding a professional service agreement with Tower Engineering Company to the uh, September 28th Council agenda. This uh, agreement is to get the plans and specifications uh, ready to conduct uh, repairs on um, Stokely uh, Tower uh, that is in need of repair. Uh, staff expects an upcoming uh, professional service agreement in the amount of $15,000 to continue contract with Gunnarsson Consulting uh, for uh, also uh, communication tower services that are downtown and also up on Little Mountain. Um, a, prof a professional service agreement with Associated Earth Sciences uh, is anticipated to be on the uh, September 28th. Council agenda, uh, this contract is for the well uh, installation and one year of slope stability monitored on the Skagit Highlands, uh, which there was some cracking that was detected and estimated costs for this are $65,100. Uh, next, we had project updates from Bill Bullock, uh, a bid uh, to conduct repairs to the retaining wall, wall on uh, Alpine Way was advertised September uh, 2nd, and the bid opening is scheduled for September 23rd. The engineer's estimate is 40,000 to 60,000, and the project has an estimated construction start date of August, or October 24th. The bid for the Hogue uh, LaVenture intersection improvements project is expected to be advertised uh, the first week of January. We've had some issues with the uh, high cost of asphalt, so they're hoping that uh, it will settle down and that we can get a better price on, on the asphalt. The annual uh, street improvement overlay project will include an uh, up-to-date concrete contract coming out this fall. The paving contract should be out to bid in January of 2023. Transtech and Engineering has begun working on plans, specific specifications, and engineering for Riverside Drive improvements. And uh, David Evans and Associates uh, is working on plans, specific and engineering for 30th Street improvements. A NOAA grant uh, application for these uh, improvements was submitted on August 22nd, and Department of College grant application will be uh, submitted in October of 2022. Uh, next, Isaac Huffman gave us um, some updates on the library. Uh, in wrapping up the library lighting project, images uh, were shown on the new uh, library lights. That it looks 100% better in there. Updates were also provided on summer reading, uh, the wellness fair, uh, new garden beds, and uh, the new uh, take-home kits. Uh, there was an outreach uh, assistant that was also hired uh, at the library. And um, Isaac also gave us some uh, programming updates. Uh, the next steps for the Mount Vernon uh, Library Commons project uh, were talked about included uh, the groundbreaking, which is ske uh, scheduled for this Saturday, September 17th. And uh, uh, he also discussed the foundation, uh, library foundation's uh, efforts to secure more funding and some of the fundraising that will be involved with that. And obviously that uh, closed the meeting at, uh, I think it was 6.50. All right, thank you, Gary. Next up under reports is uh, item B, which is council member comments. Any other council member comments tonight? I know we had a little time, but about all right, moving on to, did you have some, Mark? Or? Did I not have a report to give tonight? If not, I can give it later. Oh, I, we don't have it on, I can, we'll okay. put it on, we'll put it on next time. Okay, perfect. Sorry. So, Mark was ready for public safety. Sorry about that, Mark. All right, um, under s item C is mayor's report. And I think Peter probably has a clicker. And it's just maybe if you can just show a couple of the slides. Um, you know, community comments are a time for people to comment about city business. Sometimes we veer into other concerns, which is fine. Great things happen in our city. We highlight events. We invite participation. And um, as the public can see, some commenters are better at civility and perspective than others are. Um, but I did want to address Mr. Bedome's comments. Um, we didn't read all of his uh, email simply because it violated um, our rules of decorum and civility. So we're not going to do that. 
But here's what I would like to say. You know, we have never portrayed to our public that government can meet the expectations of a perfect city with no fires, no crime, no decay, no wear and tear. Um, what we would love to be able to have are smooth streets and pristine parks. Um, we'd love to have beautiful civic spaces. And that takes a lot of resources. Mm -hmm. So what we do commit to every day is doing our very best with our resources. Those resources, effectiveness, wax and wane, just like any other organization. We're dependent on funding. We're dependent on staff vacancies and staff attendance. We're dependent on weather, extreme weather. State and federal re regulations affect our effectiveness and extraordinary events. When personal expectations aren't met, we all have a choice. We can troll and we can snark on social media and we can think that's effective. We can think, how can I contribute to the success of the city? Just as the HOA has done in Eaglemont, securing water and watering their landscape to help their community look as a better place as they work through issues. We could be, we could say, well, I pay taxes. And yes, in reality, we all pay property taxes and the levy rate is the lowest rate it's been in over 20 years. All in all, we live in a great community. Living in a great community is not a right. It is a responsibility that takes us all working together. Please give us a call if you see something that needs attention because we need to know. We have 235 employees and 10 square miles of city and we serve 36,000 residents. So please give us a call. Let us know if you see something that needs attention because we want to do a good job. We all have a part to play in ensuring that Mount Vernon continues to be an amazing place to live. So we want to work together in partnership. That's my mayor's report for tonight. Um, item D is committee agenda requests. Any committee agenda requests? Mark, go ahead, please. I've uh, been contacted by a constituent in regards to, um, I guess we'd call it our gambling taxes on pull tabs and, and different things. And apparently the city, um, our current code calls for uh, a tax on the gross sales. Um, there's some, there's been a request for the city council to take a look at that and maybe look at, at a, maybe a little higher rate, but do it on net sales. So I'd like to have that as a, maybe a finance committee uh, agenda request so we could kind of look at that ordinance and have that discussion. Okay, great. Thank you. Any other committee agenda requests? All right, thank you. Moving on tonight, gotta flip my page. We have no unfinished business, that's a good thing. I don't, under new business, the first item is the Helping Hands Food Bank presentation. And I think Peter Donovan's gonna introduce our guest tonight. Thank you, Mayor. Council in 2020, Helping Hands Food Bank served an average of 3,400 uh, Skagit County families each week. Uh, that translated to $12.5 million that year uh, in uh, food, which is a lot. They've got a, an all-star staff over there. It's um, overseen by Rebecca Scrindy, the CEO, uh, who was hoping to be here tonight but could not make it tonight. And so Karen Flint, the community engagement manager, is here in her place to um, to talk with you a little bit more about what Helping Hands Food Bank is doing. Karen, welcome and thank you for your patience. Thank you. Oh, of course. Happy to be here. Madam Mayor, City Council, thank you for having me here this evening. Um, it is my pleasure and honor to talk about Helping Hands and what we do. Um, September is Hunger Action Month, and that is a time where we can raise awareness and talk about food insecurity in our community. So um, tonight, we're gonna talk just briefly about Hunger Action Month and where it came from. We'll go over a few of the Washington State statistics. We'll talk about um, a few of the Helping Hand statistics from 2021. And then we'll talk about what the future holds. And if you have any questions after that, I would be happy to answer them to the best of my ability. <laughs> um, so Hunger Action Month was brought forward in 2008, um, and it was decided that we needed to have a national conversation about food insecurity in our country. Um, as we all know, uh, food insecurity does not, it is a national issue. It's not just here in our hometown, but here in our home, our home county, it is extremely prevalent. Um, and so our goal uh, at Helping Hands is to meet people where they're at without judgment, with respect, and with kindness. And so um, as we dig into at Hunger Action Month, um, 
we meet people where we are. We have created a no barrier food bank, meaning that um, anyone from any county can come to a Helping Hands distribution location and be served without question. So you can come from Whatcom County if you want to travel to Skagit, Island County if you want to travel to one of our distribution locations. We only ask your name and what city you're from and you do not have to provide any financial information. So Washington State statistics, um, as a nation, the food insecurity rate is about 11.8%. 11.8% of people in our nation are experiencing some type of food insecurity, which really is a large number if you think about it, 11 or almost 12%. Um, in Skagit County, uh, we have about 14,000 people that identify as food insecure, which means that they've put it down on a piece of paper, that they've had the courage to say, I am food insecure. There are many people that aren't in that 14,000 that are still experienced or haven't been reached because um, they are experiencing homelessness or um, weren't able to take a survey. We often hear many statistics where you're like, where did they get that nationwide statistic? I don't remember being asked that question. So there is a lot of work to be done. Um, on average, a meal cost in Skagit County is about $3.55. When doing the math, uh, Helping Hands is able to do it at about $2 a meal. So in 2021, we uh, distributed at our four locations 3.6 million pounds of food. Our Cedar Woolley location holds about 200,000 pounds of food at a time. So uh, those of you that are good at math, I am not one of those people. It's why I do outreach. <laughs> um, <laughs> you can imagine how many times our building was filled up, depleted, and filled up again. Um, we have 97,000 hours of, of volunteering. Um, volunteering is the heart of what we do. We started as volunteers and we couldn't continue the work we do today without them. Across Gadget County um, and our four distribution locations, we had 4, 405,827 visits. Um, because we're a no barrier food bank, some of those are repeat visits. We don't. Um, stop people from coming to more than one distribution. So as you do the numbers, there's approximately, I think, 120,000 people in Skagit County. <laughs> um, that number can seem big, but you also have to think that those families are coming back um, to, or coming to one more than one distribution. We currently feed about 2,300 kids in Skagit County per month through our CHOW program. Um, we work with United Way and Skagit Publishing with that program, um, and what we do is we deliver food to kids, cutting hunger on the weekends. Many kids in our county rely on um, our school system for, for stable food, um, so breakfast and lunch, um, but what happens on the weekend when their parent is working, or what happens on the weekend um, when they need to make a meal themselves? So providing them with shelf stable and easy to cook meals so that they are getting the nutrition that they need on the weekends is something that we really strive to work for. So the future of Helping Hands. Uh, we are proud to say that we are opening two more locations. Uh, we have locations uh, in Marble Mount, Hamilton, Cedar Woolley, now Burlington um, as of the 2nd of September. Uh, and in Anacortes, and then October 6th, we'll be opening um, on the Swinomish Reservation um, in conjunction with the tribe and Inspire Church. So um, what these do is it brings, especially with the increase of fuel costs, uh, it helps people with accessibility. Um, the more locations we have, the easier it is to gain services, and so um, the more we can come to the community, the easier it can be for people to get the, the things that they need. We also go beyond food, so at any of our locations, uh, people can find solutions. Our goal is to help take people from a survival mode into a thriving mode, and what are those barriers and those gaps that we can help fill? So coming to Helping Hands, we often say we're more than a food bank, and that's going beyond food. It's doing job training. Um, and just in 2021, we uh, put in about $750,000 worth of income back into the community through our partnership with WorkSource and our job skills training program. So um, we're excited. We have a vision uh, to help this county. You know, our goal is to be out of business. If we could feed everyone in this county and we didn't need to have, we didn't need to exist, then we will have done our job. So we just ask that however you can support us through Hunger Action Month, please do. 
Uh, there are 30 ways that you can support Hunger Action Month throughout um, the month on our website and on our social media. So if you're curious about 30 different ways you can support hunger in your community, um, I implore you to go there and um, take a peek. Mm -hmm. So do you have any questions? All right. Any questions for Karin? I, okay. I have to say it's it's incredibly admirable how um, with the leadership at Helping Hands how it's grown from one location to more and more and more and so thank you for everything that you've done and the impact to the community you and the team there yes. Rebecca for sure she's amazing um, we're just we're <laughs> proud to have them in our community as a resource for for everybody so yeah. I think Councilmember Molnar um, yeah. he's our mayor pro tem he has something well, that well thank you Colin. a day of action <laughs> <laughs> I, Jill I just wanted said to say everything thing. I was going <laughs> to oh, say. But <laughs> yeah, I just want to thank you guys for all your work and uh, the great job that you do for City of Mount Vernon and Sketch County. And uh, uh, our, my fellow members and council members have been uh, encouraged to consider making a proclamation tonight. Mm -hmm. And I know the other mayors and councils uh, in Sketch County and cities are joined together this month to acknowledge that. So. Um, before I make pro this proclamation, um, is there any comments or from the council that haven't already been? I just, I just say thank you for all you in the community because this is a great resource uh, when family they cannot apply for food stamps, and we have many families of those in the community, um, and you are a great resource. I just want to say thank you for everything you're doing, uh, feeding our families and children and students. Thank school. you and the weekends. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, you know, these proclamations, uh, there's a lot of whereas. There's a lot of whereas. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so here, here we go. Go for it. Whereas hunger remains a significant problem in Washington State, where more than one in 10 Washingtonians are suffering from uh, food insecurities in our state, and whereas nearly one in six children living in Washington State live in households that have difficulty providing enough food and these hardworking families must make difficult choices between necessities such as rent, food, utilities, and medicine. And whereas the network of local food banks and then intermediary agencies represent a countywide effort to feed the hungry, made possible by the generation, generous uh, contributions of the individual civic organizations, local government, and businesses, including over 100,000 volunteer hours donated in 2021. <clears throat> and whereas a monthly donation of 75 can support 90 families a year through the buying of power of the uh, food bank, and whereas a National Hunger Action Month is a Feeding America effort to raise awareness about the hunger epidemic in the United States and to encourage individuals to take action in some form against hunger. Against hunger. Now, therefore, we, the City Council of the City of Mount Vernon, by virtue of the authority vested in us, do hereby proclaim the month of September 22nd as Hunger Action Month in Mount Vernon, Washington. And we also call upon the people of Mount Vernon to learn more about hunger in our nation and contribute generously to the agencies that compromise, uh, uh, comprise the food network in Skagit County, which supports our citizens. Thank you. Thank yes. You. Whereas. <laughs> Whereas. Whereas. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. Appreciate it. All right. Item B tonight is a street closure request. Jennifer Bernard, Parks and Enrichment Services Director, is here for this particular item. Good evening, Council. Um, in celebration of beginning uh, the construction of our newly highly anticipated Library Commons project, um, the city will be hosting a grand. Um, a groundbreaking ceremony, a grand ceremony, <laughs> um, that will be a groundbreaking ceremony um, on this Saturday at 10 a.m. And so for that, the closure of Kincaid Street between South 2nd Street and South um, 3rd Street will provide extra safety for that event, hopefully anticipating a lot of people coming and enjoying that event. So with that, staff is recommending to approve the requested street closure. Any questions for Jennifer? I'd move uh, the approval of the street closure. Second. Thank you. Uh, motion by Mark and a second by Iris. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Same sign. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Item C tonight is an approval of a resolution for fire protective equipment. And I'm Assistant Chief Brian Harris is here for this. 
Yes, good evening, Council, Mayor. Uh, before you tonight, staff recommends uh, approval for a motion to authorize the mayor to sign an accompanying resolution to donate expired firefighter personal protective equipment, otherwise known as bunker gear, uh, to the first in and education training program, otherwise known as FIGHT. Uh, FIGHT is a local 501c3 that originated here in Western Washington, and they uh, have a satellite campus here at the Northwest Correct Northwest Technical Academy, uh, right across the street from Fire Station 2, and uh, they've been providing uh, education uh, for high school kids uh, to learn fire and EMS career, and uh, they are asking us if we would be willing to donate our surplus of fire protective gear. Um, we have adopted um, and remain in compliance with uh, National Fire Protection Association guidelines that after 10 years, we have to decommission our gear which falls in line with all the manufacturer recommendations. So we have a, a few sets of gear that we'd like to donate to them. And uh, we recommend uh, approval for us to enter in this resolution to donate this gear to this fine organization that does support our community. Mm -hmm. All right, any questions for Assistant Chief Harris? Uh, if I hear no questions, I would motion to authorize the mayor to sign the accompanying resolution to donate uh, expired firefighter personnel protective equipment, bunker gear two, first in training and education, Fight. Thank you. It'd be resolution 1018. All right. Motion by one. Second. Second by Mary. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Item D tonight is the approval of an agreement with Cartograph and Chris Phillips, our public works director, is here for this item. Chris. Hi, thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Council. Um, city staff recommends uh, that City Council authorize the Mayor to enter into an agreement with Cartograph to provide a cloud-based maintenance software work order, preventative maintenance, capital asset management, and facility re renewal solution. City staff has briefed City Council on three occasions in committee on the merits of Cartograph maintenance software and a 2022-2023 funding strategy. Public Works staff has discussed the funding approach with the finance director who supports this initiative with the 2022 appropriated funding. Additionally, the city attorney reviewed the provided contract, uh, made some recommended changes, which were incorporated into the final version, which is before you. Uh, training and implementation will be phased over the next 10 months um, to ensure success, and the total cost strategy is there um, from 2022 through 2025. City staff previously noted that Cartograph software is integrated with recently purchased OpenGov financial software and existing Civic Plus software for the city. So all of that will be an integrated platform. And uh, the city staff's recommendation is that for council to authorize the mayor to enter into an agreement with Cartograph, pending your questions. All right, any questions for Chris on this particular item? No questions. I'll. Uh make a motion that council authorize the mayor to enter into an agreement with Cartograph. I'll right. second the motion. All right, motion by Melissa and a second by Juan. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Motion carries, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. That completes our agenda items. And while I'm looking for the script of what I'm supposed to say, I'm just gonna wing it. <laughs> Um, we do have a need for entering into an executive session tonight. The executive session will be for approximately 30 minutes, beginning at 8.30 p.m. and ending at 9 p.m. Uh, there will be no final action after, and I'll ask our city attorney to read the legal definition of what we will be discussing. Thank you, Mayor. The grounds for executive session tonight will be discussion with legal counsel regarding city enforcement actions, litigation, or potential litigation to which the city a governing body or a member acting in an official capacity is or is likely to become a party when public knowledge regarding the discussion is likely to result in adverse legal or adverse financial consequence to the city pursuant to RCW 4230 subsection 1101 I. Uh, again, 30 minutes, no final action after. All right. With that, we'll be adjourned at 824, three minute break and enter into executive session at 830. Thank you.